past hour, our colleagues have been reporting an aftershock in the city of Gaziantep in Turkey following Monday's devastating earthquakes. More than 24,000 people are now known to have been killed in Turkey and Syria. Syrian state media says the government has now approved the delivery of emergency aid to rebel-held parts of the country. But agencies are calling for more cross-border access from Turkey. As the work continues, there have been some remarkable rescues. Our correspondent Howard Johnson reports. Little Musa Hamedi from Jindiris, Syria, walks on top of the rubble that once imprisoned him. Badly bruised and wrapped in bandages, he puts on a brave face. He was among four people pulled from the rubble four days after Monday's deadly double earthquake. Musa's rescue defies the odds. Experts say 90% of survivors are rescued within the first three days after an earthquake. Tragically, no one else from his family survived. His care now rests in the hands of volunteers in a country already pushed to the brink by a decade-long civil war. But in a rare act of clemency, the Syrian government have given permission for international aid to be delivered to rebel-held areas. Across the border in Turkey, rescuers in Gaziantep work day and night, acutely aware their window of opportunity is beginning to close. Unfortunately, uh, we, we have our team, uh, K9 uh, uh, dogs that are searching for survivors in Atakiyama. Uh, Atakia, sorry, and uh, unfortunately, no luck today. Uh, they couldn't find anyone, but we are continuing the search tomorrow and we are still hoping. And the world is watching. In New York, the Turkish UN mission is busy packing aid and organizing its delivery to those most in need. And in the UK, the Disasters Emergency Committee say their earthquake appeal raised £32.9 million on its first day including £5 million donated by the government. Money that will go to help homeless survivors like Sahir and her son Ronnie Oli, who miraculously escaped from the seventh floor of this building in Gaziantep. The earthquake was never ending. My son was screaming, but somehow we managed to get down the stairs. A BBC News crew was there to witness mother and son reunited with father. He'd driven for three days to get here. This joyous hug, a reminder of the preciousness of life and love. Howard Johnson, BBC News. Um, we're taking you now to Karam Mamaris. Um, it's a minor city. It's known as Marash. It's northwest of Gaziantep. Um, Gaziantep, very close, around 20 miles from the epicenter of the earthquakes which struck on Monday morning. Population of around 380,000 here in Karam Mamaris. Surrounding area, mountainous. The city, though, obviously a commercial area, it produces olive oil, spices. And, that, and again, another city that was largely destroyed during that earthquake. We've seen um, pictures now. You can see the rescuers. I mean, we can show you just from above the devastation, the widespread devastation. I mean, the widespread devastation that has hit this city. And just this, these pictures from yesterday. Aerial shots just showing buildings raised to the ground. And the rescuers, the big machinery coming in to clear rubble. You can just see how many people would have been displaced from their homes, which, again, is the bigger concern now in, as there are freezing conditions. But even those buildings which are still standing, um, they're not deemed safe at this moment in time. So. Now the situation really is when it comes to aid for those who are homeless, displaced and still rescuers looking through the rubble with some faint, faint hope of finding survivors. Let's speak now to our Middle East correspondent Tom Bateman who's in the southern Turkish city of Adana. Um, Tom, good morning to you. Uh, I'm just uh, seeing the image uh, behind you now. A couple of things draw my attention. To, to the left behind you, as we're looking at it, we can see, of course, the heavy machinery work we're familiar with. And then I'm just looking over your other shoulder. I'm seeing clothing hanging out on that balcony there. And it sort of gives a sense of pe people just try, trying in some way to carry on living, those who survived, in any kind of a normal way in such desperate situations. 
Yeah, well, to start with your first point, Charlie, um, five days and five nights these rescuers have been here doing this recovery work. It's incredibly precarious and dangerous. I was speaking to a few of them earlier in the week, and even by a couple of days in, they were absolutely exhausted. Not only is it you know, physically hard work, but what's been happening here is every hour, a few hours, another body will be pulled from the rubble. Another one last night, and they believe there's probably around another 20 under what remains, and they're getting close to the lower levels of this building. And as to the second point, Life, of course, has to go on for people, but actually the reality is nearly all of these buildings around here have been evacuated because they're not safe. So what we've seen is things really frozen in time. And the reality for people who live in this neighborhood is that they are displaced. Some have been able to go to camps, but otherwise what we're seeing is a city of street fires, a city of people trying to survive and stay warm at night. And they come to these points because these are their neighbors, these are their friends. We were chatting to some of the people here. One man lived in this building. He happened not to be at home at the time overnight with his family when the building collapsed. They've been telling us about another friend, a carpenter, and his family that lived in this building waiting for news. The body was pulled out from under the rubble last night. So it is this continuing grief, appalling news, terrible work for what is now effectively a recovery operation for these workers and at the same time this deepening humanitarian crisis. Tom, I know that uh, some of uh, our BBC colleagues are reporting uh, aftershocks even today, I think in the last hour or so, and that's a real worry, isn't it, given what you said already about the precariousness of the buildings and the infrastructure there. Uh, what, what do you know about that? Yeah, I mean, we felt uh, aftershocks here in Adana uh, in the days after the quake uh, this morning. BBC colleagues, the BBC team in Gaziantep felt their buildings shake uh, quite powerfully around an hour and a half ago. So the aftershocks are continuing. I mean, it's pretty normal for them to happen at a low level in the days and weeks after an earthquake. But the concern is always of those more powerful aftershocks. And as I say, buildings that are already badly damaged um, there's the ongoing concern that buildings will collapse. And we saw that in the 24 hours, in the, uh, at least um, several days after the initial quake itself, that there were buildings still coming down. So you've got residents and people here not only having to evacuate their buildings, but others have simply left with told of thousands of people that have tried to get to relatives elsewhere in the country because they don't want to stay in a region where there is still a grave danger.